Well, welcome to this week's edition of Working the Web to Win. I'm your host, Carl Weiss. With me in the studio is Hector the Connector Cisneros. I'm here with everybody else. And with us, uh, we also have a special guest from uh, Venice Beach, California, Elliot Kotek with uh, Project Daniel. How are you doing today, Elliot? Good day, guys. Doing well. Thanks for asking. All right. Today, our topic is taking your medicine online. Is that like castor oil or, or? Well, actually, the nice thing about taking your medicine online is you don't have that bad aftertaste. That's, that's one of the benefits of it, actually. But what we're going to be talking about are a lot of the medical technologies yeah. that are, are, are now literally changing the ways in which most people go to a doctor. I don't know if you saw my little robo-doctor down here. Yeah, I saw that was pretty cool on your blog. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of that, but before we get into the meat potatoes of our episode today, maybe you want to give our listeners the call-in number in case they want to join the conversation. So for our guests out there in Cyber World, the call-in number is 213-943-3808. That's 213-943-3808. Of course, you can also find us at workingthewebtowin.com. You can also look us up on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, and YouTube. And YouTube. That's right. We now so. have our new studio. We uh, broadcast on YouTube every week as well. Yep. And you can not only, what's great about the YouTube feed, of course, is not only can you hear all the cool stuff we're talking about, but you can actually see what we're doing in the studio. You'll be able to see Elliot. Yeah. And also you get to see all the really cool Easter eggs that uh, Nash puts into the show, too. So. We don't even know. It's yeah. even surprised us. Right. But before we get started, too, we also want to thank our sponsors. We have uh, Avia E. Right. And we also have Tub King, if you want to say a couple of words about them. Well, I know that if you're looking for a great walk-in tub, or if you're looking for a really cool-looking, you know, clofa tub, Tub King is one of the premier places to get them because, again, they actually feature their tubs in the movies a lot of times. So, mm -hmm. Carmen Diaz has a tendency to like them real long. And, of course, if you're trying to quit smoking, VAE's new electronic cigarettes are the top quality ones out there. And, again, they're very low cost, uh, save you about 50 to 75% over real cigarettes. Plus, you don't get all the carcinogens and all that nasty stuff that kills people. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the, the face of, of actually going to a doctor has, has been uh, revolutionized by a lot of these technologies. Because, you know, back, I mean, this show just kind of dates me, but back when I was a kid, they actually still used to make house calls from doctors. Right. Well, well, now you can make a mouse call yeah. because now they have telepresence doctors. I mean, both uh, uh, people that you can actually call in and talk to, and, and for some hospitals, they actually have these cool-looking little robot devices where the uh, doctor, you can actually see the doctor while yeah. he's talking to you, and some of them even have the facilities to now do... Um, Surgery by telepresence. Well, believe it or not, when I was in college, which was about 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I don't even remember, uh, I actually worked for the Army. Uh, and one of the things we did was I, we worked on telepresence. As a matter of fact, I wrote a paper, uh, co-authored it with, with a major that I was uh, attached to in the Army, and it was about telemedicine. And what we were trying to do is figure out ways to help soldiers in the field. So this is really a progression of that in a big way. Yeah, and it's uh, also come out of NASA. Right. Uh, because face it, you know, when you've got the guys up in the International Space Station, right, you it's kind of hard to make a house call. Right, you can't fix them up there. So. <laughs> Although they send doctors with them a lot of times. You know, so. <laughs> but one of the uh, things that, that we're seeing right now is a complete, I guess, what you call a sea change in the way in, in which people can access medicine. Yeah. And not only is, is it just ex, uh, affecting the way in which people can, you know, more or less interface with doctors. But, mm -hmm. but there's now a lot of ways in which the doctors can interface with the patients. Uh, a couple of things that we were talking about in, in the blog that we wrote this week had to do with some of the uh, new devices now that actually monitor your health. Right. So, I mean, if, if you look at all the different things, I mean, back in, in the Army days, we were trying to figure out if we can get a corpsman, we could talk to him, and, and the doctor could walk him through doing some procedure. But... Now, the medical industry is latched on to the internet so much that, I mean, there's lots of different things. You know, you got electronic medical records so that any doctor can see what your past history mm -hmm. is and so on. You got telemedicine for actually doing the medicine online. You got internet communications between doctors, uh, which is knowledge sharing. And think about the show we did not very long ago about Google trying to cure this. Right. And sharing all the information on statistics and so on. Yeah, but I mean, there's also a lot of new devices coming out. I mean, I've seen bracelets that monitor your health. Right. Uh, literally, they, they have, there's a whole line of clothing now that will actually monitor various functions of your, your health in yeah. real time and send the signal to your doctor. 
So if you're somebody who, say, is a, a diabetic or, you know, you have some other type of chronic medical uh, condition, they now have the technology to, to keep your doctor in the loop in real time. It's yeah, and again, that's stuff. an outgrowth of the different types of wearables that we've been talking about yeah. for a couple of years. And, you know, all the smartphones and smart devices and smart watches, and now they got smart medical devices. Oh, yeah, literally everything from head to toe. Uh, speaking of the head, uh, Google just announced smart contact lenses right. that are actually going to be a boon to people that are diabetics because instead of having to prick your finger just by wearing these smart contact lenses, the contact lens itself can actually detect the level of glucose in, in your blood, blood through your, your tears. All right. And, of course, they had the, the printable type of devices. So they have printable skin and... I mean, I got a whole lot list of things that we'll get into before it's all about. We'd like to talk to Elliot maybe about uh, Project Daniel mm -hmm. and Not Impossible Labs. So, Elliot, tell us a little bit about Project Daniel and how you got involved and so on. Very cool. Well, uh, Project Daniel all got started because of an article in Time Magazine about uh, eight months ago, and it was an article about this doctor who was working alone and packed up in the Uber Mountain on the border of Sudan and South Sudan. And uh, he was helping people out there as kind of a lone wolf, a lone doctor. Uh, and uh, one of the kids up there, his name's Daniel, uh, had both his arms blown off by an Antonov bomb that was dropped on the region and continues to get, they continue to get dropped on the region. And uh, so Daniel lost both his arms. And Nick, uh, my co-founder at Not Impossible Labs, um, is a bit of an action hero, and uh, he decided to make something happen for both Dr. Tom and for Daniel. And we uh, produced a project that actually went live in November, and we sent a team of four people up into the Nuba Mountains uh, via a refugee camp called Yida, which uh, the UN ranks as the most challenging on the planet. And uh, we set up uh, a 3D printing prosthetic lab up in the Nuba Mountains in this one doctor hospital that uses solar power and uh, printed Daniel a, a, an arm uh, in November and then uh, enabled him to feed himself for the first time in two years. I understand that was just uh, the tip of the iceberg, though, because after you uh, made the prosthetic arm for uh, Daniel, then you actually showed the people in Sudan how to use this technology to produce the same types of uh, prosthetic arms for other victims. That's right. That was actually the greater goal of the project, was we didn't want to be these kind of fly-by-nighters who come in, drop off a couple of resources, uh, kind of food aid style, and then kind of get back on our private jets and pop out again. Um, with much more DIY than that, we kind of wish we had some of those resources available to us. Um, but we managed to uh, not only get Daniel Zahn, which was kind of the first priority, uh, but also to train a group of a half dozen uh, guys up in the Nuba Mountains. Many of them have what we consider would be only a fourth or sixth grade education, uh, some of whom have never used laptops before, and, of course, none of whom have really had any sort of direct experience, even knowledge of 3D printing. And half a dozen of these guys now know how to 3D print and fit a prosthetic limb and they've managed to continue the project and print an extra arm a week. There are about 50,000 amputees in Sudan as a result of the, the war that's been running there for years, going back to Darfur, uh, which is the similar region that obviously is uh, one of those words that was on everybody's radar not so long ago. So they have their own printer now, I take it, so they can create so their own there's limbs. There's two printers left there. Uh -huh. yeah. so how, about, how about printers. the consumables? How do, they, how do they get the consumables for the 3D printer once they run out of their initial... Batch, or did you take a whole plane load of the stuff out there? Um, we took what we could. I mean, there, there's only four people and a whole yeah. lot of luggage, and actually only really one of those guys had the capacity to, to make the arm to teach that to men. Um, the rest of the guys were photographers and a mm -hmm. logistics expert and, a, um, and an Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker, which uh, will lead to a feature-length documentary later this year. Um, but there's a three-minute clip up um, on YouTube at the moment uh, that kind of gives a cool visual of the project, and we've met with some really fantastic response to it. Um, yeah, and I've actually got your uh, your homepage here for uh, notimpossiblelabs.com, so all of our viewers will be able to see it. Yeah, with the videos, and and what's really interesting is that the fact that you know, I mean, Sudan. I mean, talk about a place that's you know it's way a war off torn the grid. Place too. It's like not a really friendly place for uh, any and, of this kind of stuff. Well, and it's the last place you'd expect to see such high tech, you know, construction technology being carried out. Yeah. 
That's what's really interesting about a lot of the new technologies is they can go to a lot of the places where doctors can't. Because, of course, you know, how many doctors would want to volunteer to, you know, go to Sudan right now? When we did our research paper... You're seeing it with software on the telemedicine side. Mm -hmm. You're seeing it with, like, Peak DEK, where they're doing eye diagnostics straight into the app on the cell phone using the high-resolution cameras that are now on our phones. And for us, taking this technology to Sudan, yeah, it's absolutely the last place you'd expect the first prosthetic lab and school to be in the world in an active war zone, yeah. which obviously can only inspire people to say, well, if it can happen there, well, then obviously it can happen elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and so we're hoping that not that we can go everywhere and do it for everybody, but that we inspire other people to set up similar operations elsewhere and really can have a global impact. Uh, we're, believing, we're total believers in the DIY open source, that people can make it better than us, that people can take it further than us, and if it just has to rely on just the two of us over here in the office, then uh, it might be slow going, but hopefully we can, uh, one of our mottos is help one, help many. So if we can tell this story in the right way, hopefully we can inspire people to help a whole lot of people all over the place. And hopefully we can help you help, you know, right. the world a little bit with our show here. Well, also, I just want to remind our guests, I mean, again, if you go to the blog, on the blog itself, there are show notes page. It has links to about three or four dozen articles. Obviously, one of them is theirs. Uh, there are also links to other vendors and uh, creators that make all kinds of really cool projects, like the Da Vinci robotic mm -hmm. um, uh, surgery device. Um, Innovative Wound Care, which is the one that does the clamping that shuts out right. bleeding for for traumatic uh, cuts and stuff like that and so on so again if you go there you have all this stuff and if you're in club w cube the folder has all this stuff for you there already for you so club w cube members can get all that stuff very quickly but what i think is really interesting about this type of technology and telepresence and telesurgery and things like that is it's literally going to help people that are in places where doctors would not norm would fear to tread right you know, but if you can send them there using technology... I mean like the United States because of Obamacare and we're well, losing well, all our doctors. We won't get into that right now. We <laughs> actually actually had a little bit on that earlier. But uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, there's just like um, Doctors Without Borders, right. things like that, where they literally fly to a lot of these places. But how often can they do that? Well, if you can have telepresence, telesurgery, they don't have to leave home. Right. You know, it, it, it gives them the opportunity to help people that normally could not get medical help. That was always the initial goal of, of the military. They wanted to be able, because again, you only have so many doctors, right. and to train a doctor costs a huge amount of money. So if you could actually have corpsmen in the field that could actually take some of these devices right. with them and go out there and do that kind of stuff, it would save it would save lots and lots of lives, especially in a battlefield, because once you get wounded, usually what, you, what kills you is you bleed to death. Right. Not not the actual wound or, mm -hmm. you know, the, you, just, you just bleed out because mm -hmm. you don't have anybody to stop the bleeding or and so on. So some of these devices that they've come out with it can really make a big difference. Oh, yeah. And also, too, they're, they're now able to bioprint human tissue. Right. I've seen them bioprint ears, noses. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things they that they can, can print, print any today. kind of prosthetic you can imagine. You know, so, and they can oh. print uh, replacement parts for the robotic devices and stuff. So, it's a big, big jump in technology over the last few years. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note about some of the things that I've seen people use these things for. So, let me bring that back up over here. Okay. Um, again, the, the medical industry has been growing in leaps and bounds on the internet. And part of it is because they're really trying to figure out ways to save money mm -hmm. because... The cost of medical, oh, of course, uh, medical it's, it's oh, yeah. shooting through the roof you know, at like two to three times the rate of inflation. So, and it's by, been doing that for quite some time, actually. So by being able to do all these different things remotely, it can actually save people. Like, for example, if you live out uh, in the country, mm -hmm. the doctors aren't out in the country, so that, that's another way of getting medical help. If you're in a, uh, like a nursing home, mm -hmm. you can have doctors monitoring you remotely. Right. So that, again... It can circumvent a medical disaster or a medical uh, event, like a heart attack or something like that, because they pick up the monitor and the monitor says your heart rate's going up or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, it could prevent a lot of really bad things from happening. Um, I noticed that a lot of athletic performances monitoring devices are also sort of mixed in with this thing. And oh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. That's becoming an industry all on its own. And I'm thinking about the, the, the insole, mm -hmm. the bionic insole right. that you yeah. had in your article that was pretty cool for that kind of stuff. Um, 
And again, just like you said, in the floor and all those, the, the war-torn areas, mm -hmm. dangerous areas, areas like after typhoons and hurricanes that wipe out whole areas, right. these are other areas that these kinds of uh, medical devices can make a big difference for. All right, but you know you know, it's really spurring all this. It's business, yeah. okay? Because if, they, if there's a profit in it, then big business is going to get involved. And one of the articles that I picked up from the web was it says, IBM sees large market for wireless health monitoring devices. As people are building these devices, the bigger companies are realizing there's a buck to be had here. Yeah. So that's what sustains this type of an industry. And what's really neat about that, with all these new technologies coming out, that's actually spurring lots of new jobs. If you look at the job market, it's pretty much flat. Mm -hmm. But in the medical industry, oh, it's pretty it's much taken off. The and, roof. and speaking of that specifically, there's a new, I mean, I'm the social media director for the company, so anything mm -hmm. in the social media is pretty exciting to me. And there now is a website that's exclusive to the medical industry for social networking. You're talking about MedMasters. I'm talking about MedMasters. Right. And their their product is, it's sort of like the LinkedIn right, for the of social network, but right. specifically for the medical industry. And they, they really have a lot of cool things that they can do. So, for example... It's now free mm -hmm. for anybody who's looking for job, you know, job seekers, recruiters, manager hires, and employers. And that's a big plus because, again, you can get in there and look at the features and all that kind of stuff. But it has some pretty advanced features like for recruiters, they have a thing called MedMatch, which allows them to match personnel specifically against jobs. Yeah, and they said that they also allow people to put on uh, video uh, resumes. And one of the, the new nice. features, which I know LinkedIn and a bunch of other people mm -hmm. plan on adding to their networks, is that if you're a job seeker, you can actually upload your video resume, which gives you a leg up on the competition. So they got some really cool advanced features, and we'll talk more about that later. But again, really, really powerful networking, and it's exclusively designed for medical people by medical people. Well, like I said, it, you know, everybody today is connected to the web. Yep. And, and I'm sure, Elliot, you know, with some of the far-flung places that you find yourself going to, I mean, how many places have you been to that are, that are completely off the grid with, as far as the Internet is concerned? No matter how deep the team went into Sudan and even up to the Mountains, where, as I said, they're relying on solar technology, mm -hmm. solar power to run these apparatus, to run that hospital. Um, they do have backup generators, but of course, right. they're all really super expensive out there. Yeah. But the one thing that the team totally expected was that they would go dark at some point, and, and they didn't. Um, no matter where they were, they still found themselves with access to the internet. It's and amazing, of isn't it? Really, you think that's huge because the files can be updated, other things can be sent across. So, um, and no point it can really go dark, which was actually something that. I know Nick was looking forward to getting it off the grid for a couple of days and, or even, you know, the full month, but uh, he was still accessible. We still managed to Skype with the hospital um, ahead of time and, uh, and still do and keep in touch with them. Of course, there was an escalation in the violence after the team left, so uh, a couple of those places were evacuated. But there's still access. That's an amazing thing about the web. Yeah, I know it's everywhere. You you wouldn't want to do for a month without Twitter, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know Hector wouldn't. Actually, my favorite is Twitter, but it's because you can just knock out those short sound bites. And speaking of Twitter, again, in the social media world, Men Masters is going to be, in my opinion, king of the social networking for the medical industry, mainly because of all the features they really have. Now, getting back to, you know, the different things that you can do, um, I know that. One of the things we were experimenting with, which was remote cameras, we'd have a camera tied to the guy's helmet or right. something like that. They'd be out in the field, and they would be transmitting this stuff with radio signals. Right. So Before the web. Right, before the web. So when you were out there in the field, actually we had the ARPANET, but it was like, that was semi-useless. How were you connecting with the, the U.S.? Or was it with a sat phone? Or? No, the sat phones, I mean, we had... Uh, we sent the sat phones out with the team, so in case of emergency, they'd be able to, and we kind of knew the GPS coordinates ahead of time, so just in case that anything super serious happened, uh, they'd be able to potentially, you know, get some help. But um, really, it was just computer to computer. It was just a lot of Skype. And it's the way we kind of do everything and not impossible is that we rely on a community of innovators, and people kind of come from wherever, and... On our teams, whether it's the iRider, the Brain Rider, or Project Daniel, um, we've got team members from MIT on the East Coast, um, from up in Sacramento. We've got some engineers up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we've had people calling from Korea to offer advice. 
Um, we've really had this kind of true global representation of talent that are willing to volunteer an hour or two of their time to weigh in on how to innovate and how best to make these projects happen. And, and that's curious. where the, the real revolution is. I'm still curious that how were you getting your internet connection? Was it from cell phones? Was there a tower out there? I mean, it's a I mean, camel with a satellite dish on it. Well, that's right. It's, um, there's, there's still uh, some old phone lines, and then, uh, and then you've got yeah, you've got some radio towers that come from the radio stations as well, things like that. So when the when the when the internet actually goes down at the hospital, the doctor walks for about ten five to ten minutes to go over to the local radio station out there. Um, and uses their network. Okay, cool. <laughs> Tell us about some of your other projects. You're talking about the uh, iWriter, for, for one. Yeah, the iWriter was what started it all, and that was a project um, for a really well-known, established graffiti artist here in Los Angeles who um, got ALS, mm -hmm. uh, had an onset of ALS with those disease, so his entire body shut down, and Mick was able to bring a team of hackers together from all over the world um, to here, actually, to, to the offices here in, in Venice Beach, and they hacked a solution for him, which was a kind of crazy pair of really cheap frame glasses with a PlayStation camera that was hacked and put the uh, face in front onto the, so it could read the eye movement. Um, basically, it's an early edition of ocular recognition software, and it enabled Temps to be able to blink to turn a cursor on, move his eye to write with the cursor, and then blink to turn it off again. And he, it was a kind of a revolution in and of itself and enabled him to draw for the first time in a number of years. And that became the subject of an award-winning documentary. It was one of Time Magazine's Top 50 Inventions of 2010. His motto and all those kind of cool tech guys kind of came on board and helped promote it as well. And, uh, but now, ALS being what it is, mm -hmm. um, the deterioration is progressive. And so now we're coming up with a solution that is uh, reliant on EEG waves and e we call it e-cognition software, where it's measuring the brain waves and being calibrated for the brain waves. So then even though his eye blinking power has reduced, he might be able to use this device um, built into a baseball cap or something like that where he can actually just use his thoughts to control the cursor and be able to draw. Pretty soon you'd just be able to take his brain out and just yeah. hook it up. Well, know? they're doing that with a lot of devices now where they're actually reading the brain waves and they, they can control devices. Yeah. Uh, they're doing that with a number of prosthetics, too. Well, a few of these devices coming through onto the market, um, but what we're hoping to do is do one with fabric electrodes so that it can be built into something wearable mm -hmm. that doesn't look too, uh, too much like it's stepped out of some sort of sci-fi movie. Yeah, is that what you got under your hat right now, Elliot? <laughs> <laughs> and again, I like the idea. I like the idea of the wearables much more better than the implantable things because I mean, yeah. one of the things we talked about when when we looked at the this uh, specific subject, they have a lot of new implantable type devices. Mm -hmm. So, for people who have migraines, they mm -hmm. have this implantable thing that suppresses the SPG nerve right. in your head, so you don't get headaches, and they have all this subcutaneous thing. You have the the. They're not implantable, but they sit on top of your eye mm -hmm. um, for the contact lenses and so on. But a lot of implantable type devices. So, for example, they actually have printable organs that they put inside. They mm -hmm. can actually print um, an artificial heart. Right. Uh, so all these different types of things are pretty exciting. But the biggest concern I have, and again, we've talked about this in the past, if these things are connected to the internet so that doctors mm -hmm. can monitor them and but all they, that kind of stuff. They could be hacked. They could be hacked. Yeah. And if they could be hacked... You know, I mean, we know that the medical records can be hacked, you know, but it, I know Cheney was worried about his heart, heart yeah. you know, heart monitoring thing being hacked because that's why they were keeping him out of the loop and a lot of different things. So that's one of the things I think we have to watch out for is to make sure that they make these devices so that they just literally have some kind of level of security to get into them. Yeah, but it doesn't them. matter how high the level of security, anything can be hacked. In fact, what was the thing with uh, Target? Do, do, you know, do you know how that all started? was a pair of teenagers. Yeah. They created a little block of software that was picked up by some cyber criminals, and that's how they broke into Target and a number of other yeah. high security systems. Yeah. Okay, so it, if, if, if you are connected to the web, you can be hacked. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Well, I know that I, I worry about with Obamacare and stuff like that. We're just going in and trying to sign up, you know, 
it's easy for them to hack that no. system. Yeah. In fact, and, what was it? Kevin Mitnick, who's right. one of the world's most notorious hackers, literally said that the security on on, on the healthcare, yeah, dot gov is is a joke. All right. So, so that's one of the biggest problems I see. Um, but again, you know, it's new. The hackers haven't jumped onto it yet. So, mm -hmm. so far we got a little bit of a reprieve. Um, I know we got about five minutes left, about four minutes left. I want to thank uh, Elliot for coming on the show with us and enlightening us about, you know, the Project Daniel, because I think that's a very exciting project, and that's something that could be repeated over and over and over all across oh. the globe. Yeah, well, we'll stay connected with Elliot here, because as they do other projects, we'll have him back on the show again. Um, Thanks, guys. We also talked to a lot of innovators uh, each week, and so we've done a post new video for the innovators that we talked to that are involved with the Not Impossible community. So... It's not impossible labs.com. Uh, feel free to check it out and yeah. submit a cause or join a team if you want to get involved in the main community that pulls up the healthcare sector. Sounds like something right up our alley, Elliot. That sounds perfect. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate yeah. the time. And we also want to thank our sponsors, our sponsors today. Right. So we want to thank uh, VIE uh, Electronic Cigarettes. Uh, they're helping lots of people quit smoking regular tobacco. And they're making it so that people can get healthy. And I mean, again, I, if they were around when my father was around, he'd be living a heck of a lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to thank uh, Tub King. Uh, again, the best walk-in tubs that you can get. Premier walk-in right. tubs. And I know they have a special that's going on, I think, right now to the end of the month. Well, both they and VE have a special. Right. So, you know, if you click on, if you go on to Working the Web to Win, click right. on the banner, you can go right over right. to it. You can get the specials for neither one of them. I also want to, uh, again, mention MedMasters because, again, this is a, I know they're relaunching their website and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They've actually come up with a whole bunch of innovations that can be really powerful tools for people in the medical industry. For and again, people that want to get into the medical industry, oh, That's too. right. And there's a lot of people wanting, because that's mm -hmm. where the jobs are. That's I mean, right. Let's face it, that's where the jobs are. That's where and money is Whether you're a pharmaceutical sales or a doctor or a nurse IT, practitioner or IT, IT person, IT, right. they have really far superior tools to any other social network. And again, now social networking is my, my gig. Mm -hmm. They really have some very powerful tools that people Yeah, we'll, we'll have Rick from. Fromm, who's the CEO of we'll, MedBest. We'll have him on a we'll, we'll show. We'll have him come and do one of the shows. Um, we also want to talk about the free book. If they go to workingthewebdowin.com, right. they can download our, our free copy of our book. And, of course, please go to the notes page because there's really a ton of useful information on the notes page. And, of course, our Club WQ people, they get all that stuff free no matter what. Yeah, and I, now, you know, one of the one thing that, that we didn't really bring up a lot, like you were talking about hacking. But, you know, today people are so worried about Google is Google watching you? Right. Is the NSA listening to you? And now you got all these people running around with all these medical devices right. that literally they're saying, watch me, you know, <laughs> is my heart working right? Is, you know, blood pressure working right? And in fact, the, the next show we have next week is called The Surveillance Society. Right. But we're going to talk about all the ways in which somebody can get the drop on you that they can watch you. Literally, they can turn on your webcams. I mean, they're, they're just... It's getting to the point where, you know, George Orwell was an optimist. Right. And His as, big and brother is here in a big and, way. And the reality is, setting up your own surveillance system is, is next to nothing. It's cheap. I mean, surveillance cameras cost, you know, 50 bucks, 40 bucks, or whatever. That's why you see them everywhere. I mean, you know, you go to London, I mean, I, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of cameras they say are down there. Literally, if you sneeze, you know, somebody on the system is going to say, bless you. Yeah, and then on February 11th, we're also going to do a show called, Are You Ready for the Internet of Everything? And then after that... The big data, big danger. That's right. That's what that's yeah, we've got some has to do with like Target and so on. Well, so. it has to do with a lot of the, the hot button issues right now that are popping up online. Because, like I said, it, there isn't a day that goes by when you get these serious data breaches of major institutions, right. banks, Second. places that you just didn't think could possibly be hacked. They're yeah. hacking into them, and you know if they can hack into those. Then, they can hack into anything. And, and then you get to that point, you know, that's when it, it becomes a very serious problem for our infrastructure. Yeah, I'm, I always tell people, Wars can know, start if, you that way. if you don't have some kind of, you know, ID protection system in place, Multiple. You're, really, you're really risking, you yeah. know, a lot of different things. A simple thing they can do is they can actually go to the three credit bureaus mm -hmm. and put a hold on their credit. Mm -hmm. And that makes it so people can't go in and get right. credit cards and so on. So that's a simple thing we'll do. Again, we'll talk about that next week. Um, we have about 20 seconds left. Okay. Anything, anything no. new and exciting? Uh, I think we pretty much covered everything we had to topics we had to cover today. So uh, all I can say is just keep, keep working, working the, the web. web. Until next time, guys. Mm -hmm.